John writes and he says that when he opened, he saw the seventh seal and there was silence in heaven for half an hour. And then I saw the seven angels who stand in the presence of God. Seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel with the gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. And at that time he was given a large amount of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense was with the prayers of the saints and went up to the presence of God from the angel's hand. And the angel took the incense burner and filled it with fire from the altar. And he hurled it down to the earth, and there were rumblings of thunder, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. And the seven angel, angels who stood with the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. We've gotten to a point in this book that's very interesting because it's leading up to the destruction of the world. And we're seeing that in this very beginning chapter here that almost if you've ever been on a ride at an amusement park, that when it goes up, 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 and you probably have an anticipation before you get on that roller coaster and it stops. I know there's one in Bush Gardens where when it gets to a certain point, you can hear the clicking of it going up, up, up. And then when you get to the very top of it, it just stops. And when it stops, you know something big is about to happen. And here what we have is not a roller coaster going tick, 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 tick. But what we have here is the seals of God that have been broken uh, in judgment that is being recorded on the earth after the time of the rapture has taken place. In Revelation chapter 8, when it speaks about that there was silence in heaven, this is very unique because at this point, if you know and studied with us, that heaven is the exact opposite of silence. In heaven, there's shouts of praise. In heaven, there's con continuous worship going on. The angels are worshiping. People there around the throne are worshiping. It's just... Uh, a sense of, of excitement. But then because of the seriousness of truly what's going to take place, and, and we'll find out later, it's what is called the woe judgment, W-O-E. That in that, there is a pause of all worship and a focus on what's going to happen. Silence can be very awkward, can it not? If you've ever been on a date and you just don't know what to say, sometimes maybe we do one or two things, talk too much or don't say anything. And if I were to stand up here in the little bit of time we have this morning, and for 30 minutes, everyone in this room were to remain silent and I did not speak, you would probably be very uncomfortable. But at this time, the reason why there's so much silence and the idea that you could even hear a pin drop, but the silence is, is because there is an anticipation of the judgment of God on the earth. And so the silence is, is for us to pay attention. It's almost as some scholars who write commentaries on the book of Revelation that I've read says that it is really just an anticipation of what is about to happen and you stand there knowing something big is going to happen. There's no talking, there's no joking, there's no laughing, there's none of that. It's simply silence in heaven. And this silence focuses in on the seven angels that even today are there, and we know the names of some of the angels, but seven angels that stand at the throne of God constantly. And these seven angels are have seven trumpets. And what we have found in verse 1 through 6 is that they stand there prepared to blow their trumpets. But before they do this, 
this one angel comes before the throne and it says in the verse that he has an incense burner filled with fire from the altar and he hurls it to the earth. This fire from the altar, this incense, we know that what this is is, is an example of the tabernacle that whenever they were in Exodus going through the wilderness, they built a tabernacle not based on their own measurements, but based on how God told them to build this. And he told them, do it exactly how I told you. Don't get one inch, don't get anything off, because this is a grand structure not to be just toyed with. And we read in the Old Testament and wonder, why was God so peculiar about all of the instruments and all of the things found there. Well, if you read Revelation, you discover quickly that it's because it's a pattern of the Old Testament of what heaven will be itself. See, God is all about order. God's all about structure. God is in the very detail of things. And then it continues, it says that this is happening and that this incense, normally when they burn incense in the Old Testament, it's the idea that it is a pleasant smell, it is burnt and the smoke of it goes up and with that is accomplished with, they have with it prayers of the people of God. That's what it is, is you see the smoke go up and you're praying and so it's an imagery of prayer and the smoke going into heaven and the pleasant smell of that God will would smell and take attention to. That's what they looked at in the Old Testament. And here is the idea that he goes in and when he hurls down this judgment, he does this and what happens is that it gets the attention of the world because there's rumblings and flashes and lightning and the earth shakes. And the seven angels stand ready to blow the shofar, the trumpets. It says the first angel blew the trumpet. And in the time of the Old Testament, if you study tradition of Judaism, you find out that trumpets are blown when it's a time of going to war. Trumpets are blown when it's a time to come to worship. Trumpets are blown when the time to get someone's attention. And what this is, is that there is a battle taking place. And so the angel blows this shofar, this ram's horn, this trumpet. And it says that immediately hail and fire mixed with blood. It comes down upon the earth. This is unlike anything that you and I have ever seen. If you've ever been in a hail storm, you know that... It can damage your vehicles, it can break glass, it can do all kinds of things, and it can even kill someone if a large enough piece of hail falls from the sky and were to hit someone. And here what we discover is that this hail is part of a judgment to the earth because these are the people that have been left behind that did not accept Christ, and because of that they're going through a tribulation period. Folks, you don't want to be here during that. If you read the Exodus story about the seven plagues that are mentioned that God puts on Pharaoh in Egypt, you find out that this is almost, you could lay it on top of each other, an example of that. I've said before, if you want to understand the radical revelation, you have to go back to the Old Testament because he's not trying to trick you with imagers. He's showing you God does not change. And that what God has done, has done in the Old Testament, He is doing even a greater work through what? Through this passage. One thing I'm amazed by is even though there's similarities, when God judged Egypt with that hail, and when God did this uh, example, it was one, one geographical area. But this judgment is global. Okay. And it says so that he does this, and it says so a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. If you think that it's bad whenever you see someone burning leaves and you have a hard time breathing, this is going to be on a global scale of what God has done. And it will be hard to see. It will be hard to breathe. So even though that you might not be part of the third that is experiencing that, 
you know yourself that that tragedy of what's happening in the destruction of the trees and the destruction of the, the grass, that all of that is still going to affect all of humanity and even the animals. So the first trumpet blows, and then right after that, another trumpet blows. So the people here on earth hear what's happening. And even those who are in heaven know what's taking place. It says the second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain ablaze with fire was hurled into the sea. The, the Greek translation when it says something like does not mean it was an actual mountain. But what it's meaning to us is that it was as large as a mountain. The Hebrew word for mountain is tel, T-E-L, and it's, it's talking about a large area. And, and many of the cities that were built there on those types of areas in Israel. And so John is trying to describe the very best he can what he sees. And he sees this large object coming out of heaven and it's on fire. And while that fire is coming down and it goes to the sea. So what was it destroyed on land? It hits the sea. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. And then it says, the third angel stepped up to blow his trumpet. So you've seen now trees and grass. Now you're seeing the, the sea affected. You're seeing commerce, the shipping enterprises affected. And it says that the third angel then steps up and he blows his trumpet and a great star blazing like a torch fell from heaven and it fell on a third of the rivers and the springs of water. The name of it was Warm, warm Wood and a third of the waters became warm wood. And so many of the people died from the waters because they had been made bitter. This image is of a toxic chemical that whenever this star falls, and it's not a literal star, but whatever it is that falls down onto this water, it will become a chemical that will be killing the fish. It will be killing people that drink of it. It will taste bitter. Have you heard recently about the great train derailment that happened here in the United States? There are videos on the news that shows reporters. My wife and I were looking at recently a few days ago and, and the gentleman that was there took a stick and the water itself looked clean. It looked just like any little river bank if you were to go out into the woods and you're hunting and you see a stream come by. He says, we have to be very careful because look at what is actually in this water and the surface of it. And he took this wooden stick and he just goes down and he just stirs on the, the dirt. It's not some kind of magic trick or optical illusion. It was actually showing and, and the water starts changing colors of yellow and blue. And, and what it is, if you've ever seen uh, someone throw chemicals out like oil and other things like that, it looks like there's some, or gas, it, it, there's something in it. And it was like, this is not safe to drink. And it's in East Palestine um, is the town that it was in. This is, don't drink this. You know, and then there's a place called Flint, Michigan. Any of you have ever heard of that? Uh, even to this day, and I, I'm, I'm really blown away of how much money we send to other countries on a side note to help them establish clean drinking water. And then we got major cities in the United States that don't even have clean drinking water. But if you think that's going to be something, imagine a third of the water supply turning into what the Bible calls warm wood, meaning a bitter, toxic, and here it's just got that taste to it. And then it says the fourth angel steps up. So all of this is happening and you would think at this point people would get repentant and, and, and want to say, well, wait a minute, this is just too much happening. We need to seek out a Savior. But it says a fourth angel blows his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck. A third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of them were darkened. So now what we have is events have happened on the water, the land, and notice what the next area is. It will be that of outer space, if you will. And so you'll see that there's destruction. 
You know, even if this is man-made, I, it would not shock me because even right now, China and the United States and even other countries are, are having all kinds of exploration in the atmosphere and in the, United, and in the world itself um, we see in space. I mean, I, I've, I can show you articles from the 80s and even earlier where they talked about how they wanted to start building colonies on the moon. Uh, that'll probably come, folks, because what'll happen is that if things so, get so bad here, they're going to be like, well, we'll just go build there on, on the, uh, the moon. And you might say that sounds crazy, and it does sound crazy, but what you're seeing in this is, is a galactic battle. If you've ever watched Star Wars, maybe that'll help you get an idea of that, okay? And then it says that these stars and a third of them were darkened and a third of the sun was out light and the night as well. And I looked up again and I heard an eagle flying overhead, crying out in a loud voice. And notice there's three more judgments to come. So what does this eagle do? What does he do? He, he cries out and he says, Woe, woe, woe to those who live on the earth because of the remaining trumpet blasts that the three angels are about to sound. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, every Sunday, pastors should have a sermon that brings, yes, joy, but there also be, should be some woe in the sermon as well to let people know that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to flee from because woe, can we just wake up for a minute? Whoa. If I can just speak just as plain to you as I can. I love sports, but I honestly think that what happens many times in our country is that we are distracted with things like the Super Bowl. We're distracted with things like the basketball games and hockey games. And I, I'm like anyone else. I enjoy that kind of stuff. But it's just like what the Caesars of Rome would do. They would put on these big Olympic-type events. Why? To distract the people, to get their minds off of what was really important. If people would really just wake up in America, our nation would be totally different than what it is. You wouldn't have a revival just happening in one area. A revival would happen throughout the entire nation. And then it says that he looks and he sees this and the, and the eagle is shouting woes because the remaining trumpets are to be blown. And then we go to chapter 9 and it says that the fifth angel now steps up and he blows his trumpet. So these last three trumpets are even worse because it says, And I saw a star that had fallen from the heaven to the earth. If we remember, Satan himself is the image of being fallen to the earth. And we're not told exactly who this was that is falling to the earth. It's just described as a star. Be very careful when someone says, you know what, you're a superstar because a star is nothing but burning gas. Some of you will get that later. <laughs> and the key to the shaft of the abyss was given to him. Now, this is probably an unnamed angel, we know, but it says that he has this key. Why? Because what is locked in the abyss is about to come out. It says, He opened the shaft of the abyss and smoke came out of it from the shaft, like smoke from a great furnace, so that the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the shaft. If you remember that the war we waged in Kuwait and Iraq and Iran in that area, when Saddam Hussein left Kuwait, he blew up many of the oil tankers that were there in Kuwait. He, he set them on fire. And, and many of the soldiers I've talked to said that when they were going in there, they'd have to turn their headlights on because they couldn't even see because of how dark. It was the middle of the day, but how dark because of what's taking place with the smoke and the fire. Here is something even greater because where does this come from? It comes from the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit, the abyss, is a place of judgment. We know hell is a place of judgment. When you die, and shocking I know as it might be, but we all will die unless Jesus is merciful to come now and we're raptured into heaven, but you'll still be given a new body. But when we die, we will immediately find ourselves 
before God, knowing if we have been accepted into His arms of forgiveness and, and His arms of love, and we know that now based on our decisions to follow Him, or will we be separated from Him for all eternity? The rich man and Lazarus is a prime example of that. The, the rich man was separated immediately, a great gulf between them. They weren't all in some kind of waiting area. They were there either in hell or suffering or they're there in heaven for their reward. And here we see hell opens up and all of this is taking place. And then locusts came out. Locusts, I give you, and if you see in the bulletin, and I'm not going to read verbatim word for word, but I give you an idea that locusts many times in the Old Testament was an example of God's judgment. God doesn't change. He shows it here. And it says that then locusts came out of the smoke of the earth. So obviously when lo this, this animal that's coming out, did not and could not be destroyed by the smoke or the fire. And it says that, And power was given to them like the power the scorpions have on the earth. And they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or the green plants or any tree, but only people who do not have God's seal on their forehead. Remember, this was the, the ones of the 144,000 and the great multitude, those that God, that have accepted God during the tribulation. So there will be some that will still be saved, but the vast majority will not. So this animal that comes up out of the abyss will be attacking people. And it says, and they were not permitted to kill them, but to do what? Torment them for five months. The idea of five month torment simply means this. It means that it's not a permanent torment. The permanent torment will not be what happens here. It will be happen what happens in hell. What you think you're going through right now, I'm not discarding. I'm sure that many of you have gone through torment with pain, emotional anguish. But I will tell you this, that's a day at Disney with ice cream in your hand compared to what you will go through in hell. Amen. What happens here is nothing compared to what will happen in all eternity in hell. And then it continues, it says that they were permitted to do this for five months. Their torment was like that of torment because by a scorpion when it strikes a man. So it's pain, but they couldn't find relief from it for five months. It says in those days, people will do what? They will seek death. If you think people are sick now wanting to seek death, they're now legalizing in many states that even... Nurses can sign off on drugs to be administered to speed up the death of someone. And here it says that people will seek death. Why? Because they hurt so bad. Any of you know someone that's just hurt so bad that their mental anguish that they would do anything to get relief even if it meant taking their own life? It happens. But folks, notice what happens here. They will desire death and they will not find it because they're going through a punishment period. It says then, it says, and they will not, it says, will not find it and they will long to die, but death will flee from them. Believers in Christ, I speak to you right now. Death has no power over you. The appearance of the locusts was like horses. Now, let me explain this. This is a phrase that I'm going to give you. It does not mean it was a horse, but like. The best example I give that to you is if you want to describe someone, you might say, they have an appearance of a donut. Now, what do you think that means? They have an appearance that they're round and, and they're mostly sweet, right? <laughs> it says they have an appearance of locusts that was like horses equipped for battle. Now, I want to say this to you. You can go and look at a hundred different commentaries on this, and it will tell you probably a hundred and one different explanations. But can I just give you the simplest explanation? The simplest explanation might not be that it was a machinery or weaponry, but simply what the Bible says it is. This is a beast. This is a demonic force that John sees, and he describes it the very best he can. He says that at this time he has quit for battle, something like that were men's faces, and they had 
hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth, and they had a chest like a breastplate, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses rushing into battle. Now, we can describe all kinds of military equipment that might fit this picture, but the best thing to fit the picture is this. It's what John described. It's just a demonic-looking figure that comes down to torture humanity that's not been sealed by God. It says, And they had a tail with the stingers like scorpions, so that with their tails they had the power to harm people for five months. In verse 11, they had as their king. Notice that even these demonic beings have a ruler. It says, As their king, the angel of the abyss. And his name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in the Greek, his name is Apollon. And their first woe has passed. And there are still two more woes to come. So what's happening? People were seeking to die. People were being attacked by this unnamed creature, if you will. And they are fleeing and they're in such torment that they just want to die. But then notice the next part. We're almost wrapping up this chapter. It says, the sixth angel steps up and blows the shofar. And from the four horns of the gold altar, this is the same description, of the Ark of the Covenant. So everything God's doing is a pattern of the Old Testament. So from the four corners of of this golden altar that is before God, I heard a voice say this to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels bound at the great river Euphrates. Do you notice in the bulletin sermon notes where I told you why the river Euphrates was mentioned? It's important to see that the river Euphrates, all of that area there, if you look in the Old Testament, you find out the Euphrates is mentioned. Why? Because it's associated with the first sin committed on earth, Genesis 2. The first murder was at there. Uh, Genesis 4, the first organized revolt against God, Genesis 11, the first war of confederation, Genesis 14, and the first dictatorship, Genesis 10. Constantly what God is doing and says is that things on this earth, although it seems like it changes and technology changes, evil is still going to be present in certain areas. If you go into the world today, you will see more spiritual conflict. And why? Because if you go to Africa and other places, folks, it would blow you away of the demonic spirits and powers that are happening even there. (coughs) This area of Euphrates will release these animals, these four beasts, it says. And so the four angels who were prepared for the hour and the day and the year were released to kill a third of the human race. Well, they've already been tortured for five months, and now you see death is coming. The number of the mounted troops was 200 million. China itself has proclaimed, and you can research this, that China has proclaimed it at any time that they could mount over this amount of soldiers. Why do you think that there's such a great population there that they can mount them and go directly down and attack there in Israel itself. There will be a great end time battle and we'll discuss that later on in different chapters. It says, And I heard their number and this is how I saw the horses in my vision. The horsemen had breastplate that were were fiery red and they had the blue and they had the yellow and, and there it says that the head of the horse was like a what? A lion's head. And from the mouth came fire, smoke and sulfur. A third of the human race was killed by the three plagues and by the fire, the smoke, and the sulfur that came from their mouths. For the power of the horses is their mouths and in their tails, for their tails which resemble snakes have heads and they inflict injury with them. Now do I know, like I said, what all this animal imagery is? No, I don't. And anyone that stands up here and tells you this is exactly what it is, it's this kind of military equipment or it's this or this, they don't know either. I'm just honest enough to tell you, all I know is that the Bible says it's it's a horrific image. Now, I'm about to finish up 
And if you've not really paid attention to anything that I've said up to this point, please, I do ask that from verse... I'm sorry, the lighting is... From the last few verses in verse 20 and 21, please mark it. Listen to what I have to say to you. The rest of the people who were not killed, how many were killed? A third. That's a lot of folks. I was reading this last night about, I don't normally stay up this late, but it's been hard to sleep the last couple nights. But I was reading this and Jess went on to bed and I'm sitting there on the couch rereading and any of you that teach, you know you want to reread your stuff and this really got me because it shows me the hardness of humanity. It says that a third of these people, the rest of them, that were not killed by these plagues. So all the other people that were left, that were not killed, all the other people that were not sealed by God. Because remember, they didn't get tortured by that plague. It says, they did something very unique. It says that the rest of the people who were not killed by these plagues did not repent. Folks, I don't know what it would take to get people to repent. You would think watching the, the and when I say amazing and awesome, I don't mean in a good way, I mean in, in a horrible way. You would think in the, the amazing things that were happening at this period of time, every knee would be falling to the ground and every tongue confessing and every eye would be filled with tears knowing that they are being spared and they're seeking God. But notice what happens. Their hearts are so cold because Scripture says that the Spirit of God will not dwell in man forever. And it says that these people would not repent of their what? Of their works. Today we have a similar thing, do we not? They're creating new ways of being evil. Think of you that are in here that have been on the earth for 50 or more years. Don't you know that things, are, they, they just create more ways to be disgusting, do they not? And you think about those little kids that come to the children's sermon. If God tarries, what will Satan create to entice them whenever things that would make us blush would not even have an effect on them? It says that they did not repent of the works of their hands to stop worshiping demons. Even during this time that they've seen all of this carnage, they still want to fall down and worship the wrong person. They worship demons and the idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood which are not able to see, hear, or walk. Their attention's on the wrong one. And, last verse, and they did not repent of their murders. Folks, it's not too late for us to repent of our murders. Pastor, I haven't murdered anyone. The Bible says that we've murdered plenty in our hearts. I mean, if we've murdered people with our tongues. You ever been cut down so bad that you just had to get away from somebody and get away from everyone and have some you time? Have you ever cut someone down so bad that they had to get away from you? It says they wouldn't even repent of it. Even today, people don't repent when they do stuff. Because it's a hardness of heart. It says they would not repent of their sorceries. The word sorcery there is the same word used for pharmacia, meaning drugs. I mean, it's bad when we go to the park with our little boy and he goes and sees something shiny on the ground and his mama says, don't pick that up because it might be laced with fentanyl. And I, I just shake my head. I'm just like, come on. But that's the world we live in, isn't it? It's the world we live in where drugs is so abundant that I can even hear in Atkinson, probably within less than five to ten minutes, I could take you to several houses that are dealing drugs. And not a thing is being done about it. 
That's the pharmacia. It's not about medicine to help you. It's about medicine, and there's nothing wrong with med take medicine to extend your life. That's what we do about taking. If you quit taking, if I quit taking my thyroid, I have no thyroid. If you remember, I've got, I had thyroid cancer. They removed all my thyroid. And so if I quit taking that medicine, I'm going to die. So there's nothing wrong with me taking that kind of medicine. But if I'm addicted to something such as drugs, come on. And some of you can get addicted to legal drugs. I've seen that as well. It says that they would not repent of it. And then notice the next thing, and I don't want to beat this dead horse because some people label me as, as doing that. Their sexual immorality. But you know, they don't know it's wrong. They don't know because why? Because they keep doing it. Their hearts have just grown cold. If you had pornography playing in your home 24 hours a day and your child was sitting there on the couch watching this, don't you know that eventually what's going to happen is that child's just going to think that's natural? If they watch mom and dad roll up their sleeve and put a needle in their arm, and I'm not talking about that they're giving themselves diabetes, um, insulin shots, but they were taking drugs or sniff, snorting something or whatever else, don't you know kids that see that are going to think that's natural? Folks, sinners are going to do what sinners do because you know why? They think it's natural. Here in the sexual immorality, you know who they're going after? Satan's going after our kids. Satan already knows at this point exactly what to do to push buttons. And he's going after them. The sad thing is many of us have completely stepped to the side in the church and said, Satan, do what you want to do because we don't want to offend our kids by telling them that Jesus is the only way. The last thing it says, order of theft. They won't, they won't even repent of stealing. <coughs> lady in the neighborhood just recently had her car broke into and her purse had $800. And my wife was telling me about that. And do you think the person that stole that? Now, God can convict that person to bring it back. But do you know that most of the time when people are breaking in your vehicles doing this kind of stuff, it's because of what? To lead and to do another kind of sin. I mean, that's the simple pact. Is that sin leads to more sin. Now, I want to close with this. My time's over with, I know, but I want to close with this. What I just read to you, none of it's happened yet. But it will happen. There is a way to avoid all of what I just read to you. To call on the name of Jesus and be saved. Amen. This world is not going to be easy. And we've never been promised that it would be. And when your life gets so easy, understand this, and you say and you boastfully brag, well, the devil don't bother me. Folks, I'll let you know, there's no need for the enemy to attack whenever the enemy looks at you and thinks you're wearing the same jersey they are. Right? I want to encourage you today, if you don't want to go through this as Tanya gets ready to come up, that the only thing you have to do is simply repent and say, Lord, please forgive me of the sins I've committed. And the Lord will forgive you. He is gracious. He is loving. I never want to scare anyone into heaven because that's not what heaven's about I want you to accept Jesus and know you have a home there not because you're trying to get like the old adage I heard someone say you're trying to get fire insurance you're not trying to get fire insurance what you're trying to do is to, to assure that you've got your name written there in the Lamb's book of life because when you die you're not going to be elbow to elbow with people that are going to hell you will be there in the presence of God The only thing I know is this. If you're born, you will die. If you're born, you will also, you will have to make a judgment call is if you'll be born again. Revelation can be very difficult to understand, but when you start piecing together verse by verse, word by word, then you start seeing, wait a minute, God has already got a pattern of things that we saw in the Old Testament. 
And if we can accept and understand that God is revealing this to us, then we don't have to experience any of it. Today, if you want to join this church, today, if you want to be baptized, today, if you would like to accept Jesus as your personal Savior, King of your life, and you feel that tugging at your heart, or rededicate yourself, Do it now before your heart gets to the point that you don't even feel bad about when you do something wrong. Pray for me as I continue to pray for you. Let's pray.